Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We will begin <coughs> this round the table that addresses one of the most palpitating issues in the Uruguayan ecology that entitles labor and delivery and the pelvic floor. We know that the multiparity and the shield birth, mainly the vaginal one, for many women represents the key physiological events predisposing to onset of urinary and the fecal incontinence, as well pelvic floor dysfunction and the genital prolapse. We know that the approximately 11% of United States women undergo surgery for this reason. Vaginal birth is a remarkable event about which little is known from a biomechanical perspective. And we have a challenge to better understand their physiology and to offer the women a better care with less risk of pelvic injuries. Uh, I'd like to introduce all the speakers uh, for the session. Uh, first, uh, the, uh, Robert Freeman for UK will present about pregnancy and the delivery which poses risk, risk to the pelvic floor. After that, Carlos Wenzel for, from Chile that will present delivery position and the perinatal trauma. And finally, Maria Luisa Riesco from, from Brazil that will present strategies for perineal trauma prevention. After finish their speech, we are joined at the stage and open the discussion with the plenary. Let's start, please. Thank you, Aparacita, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much indeed to the ICS for this really kind invitation to come and speak with you today on this subject. Uh, this is where I live and work in a place called Plymouth in the United Kingdom, and it is uh, down here for those of you who don't know. And uh, for those of you who do understand a bit about British accents, you'll understand that uh, I'm from further north up here in Scotland. Uh, and my heart and sympathies go to the interpreter who's got to try and understand what I'm saying. Anyway, um, Plymouth is probably best known, particularly for those of you from the United States, because this is where the Mayflower steps, uh, so, uh, the Mayflower rather, left Plymouth in 1620, and in 2020 it'll be the 400th anniversary, and we hope to have somebody from the White House coming to celebrate that. But this is where the Pilgrim Fathers set sail from. And if you like sailing, we also have the America's Cup from time to time. So that's my bit for the uh, Plymouth Tourist Board. These are my declarations. The only relevant one is that I'm a co-inventor of a pair of scissors called the Epi Scissors 60 to try and help cut an episiotomy at the appropriate angle. The question is, is pregnancy and delivery factors, which is more important? I think it's an academic uh, question in a sense because both are important. But where they are really important is in women who are at risk. And that's what I really want to talk about today, identifying women who are at risk of developing pelvic floor problems after childbirth, because that might help in primary prevention. And I want specifically to talk about this group, the short maternal height, large birth weight women, because that's a group in whom I think we can do something about now. And I will talk a bit about cesarean for those type of patients, but don't forget pelvic floor muscle training is probably the most important form of prevention for all women. Before that, however, I think it's important that we try and raise awareness amongst our obstetricians and our midwives regarding pelvic floor damage in childbirth. And it's what we call in our country, I'm sure you have a similar saying, uh, the elephant in the room. Everybody knows it's there, but nobody really wants to talk about it. And I think the problem is that if patients found out that there was a high risk of incontinence and prolapse as a result of, surgery, of, uh, of um, childbirth, then this is what they might say. And clearly we want to avoid lots of women requesting caesareans, but we already know that some high profile individuals, celebrities, are asking for a caesarean, mainly to fit in with their busy lifestyle. This is actually a study, uh, a slide rather, that was given to me by Don Wilson from New Zealand. And uh, this lady down on the bottom right happens to be his secretary. Can I go back one slide? Yeah, this lady down here. These are all the famous people you can see, but that is his secretary. So 
In our country, there's been a big campaign for natural birth, and I think this is absolutely correct and proper. However, there is a saying, one size doesn't fit all, and that is literally true in this case. Women do need to be aware of their potential risks of vaginal delivery. And so I think they need to be informed of the facts and also the risks, not just of vaginal birth, but also cesarean section. So let's look at some of the evidence here. This is a study that was done from the Netherlands a few years back, looking at bothersome incontinence during pregnancy and again afterwards. And you can see from the figures here that there's almost a two-fold increase in the incidence of incontinence at one year compared with antenatally. For prolapse, there seems to be good evidence that 20 years after one childbirth only, that there's a 15% incidence of prolapse symptoms. Objectively measured prolapse, the incidence is even higher, anything up to 30, 37%. And in some cases, that's thought to be less if you've had a cesarean section. Obstetric anal sphincter injury, a very important area, as you've heard about already this morning. And we know that this is a strong association with anal and faecal incontinence. And that gets worse after subsequent deliveries. And if you look in the third bullet point, at the uh, instance of anal incontinence, nine months and five years after an oasis injury, it's nearly 50%. Now, of course, an awful lot of that is flatus incontinence, but nonetheless, that can be extremely embarrassing, as you can imagine. Staining, soiling, not feeling clean is very distressing to a lot of people, and young women will find that very unpleasant if it happens after childbirth. So we need to do something about prevention. And the worrying thing about obstetric anal sphincter injury is that the incidence is increasing. And we could argue all day why that is, but I don't believe it's just improved recognition. These are data from Scotland over the last 10 years, and almost identical data come from Denmark. In England, we have a thing called hospital episode statistics, which have shown a threefold increase in the incidence of OASIS over the last 10 years. And these are the factors associated with that. And of course, as you've heard already today, when you do ultrasound, the incidence is an awful lot higher, which shows how unreliable clinical detection is. So we need to raise awareness. Secondly, we need to identify women at risk, because if you can do that, then you can do something about prevention. And we've just published this paper called You Are Choice, which is really a, a commentary about a study we're doing where we're taking two large databases from Sweden and the prolonged study, which you heard about earlier as well, to come up with a score. We're looking at various risk factors that have already been identified. These are they. And we're doing logistic regression, trying to get a score, which we can then predict which women might be at risk of developing incontinence, prolapse, faecal incontinence after childbirth. And these are some of them. I'm not going to go through them all in detail. Time won't allow it. But I want to talk firstly about urinary incontinence before pregnancy and then the short maternal height, large birth weight women. You would think that pregnant, uh, incontinence before a first pregnancy is relatively rare, but in fact the second study by Brown here suggested it was 15%. And we know these women are extremely high risk of developing incontinence in the long term. Now why should that be? It might be that they actually have a constitutionally or a genetically weak pelvic floor. And there is some evidence for that. And I was very interested earlier on today about the uh, Loxol-1 uh, enzyme, which may, would, has an effect in elastin. And some people maybe have that. Some people may have just genetically weak collagen. If you take, for example, people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and, and Marfan's, they have a high incidence of incontinence and prolapse. And of course, that's going to be worse after childbirth because the tissue doesn't heal. And you know, this isn't unique uh, to childbirth by any means. We know that connective tissue injuries, if your connective tissue is good, it will repair. But if it's weak, it might not repair. And then you get poor support, prolapse, incontinence, and so on. And as I said, it's not unique to childbirth. It's very important in sports injuries. Now here is Aguero for the football fans out there uh, who plays for Manchester City in Argentina. Now let's just say he's injured his knee and he's got weak connective tissue. That ligament isn't going to repair. And then he gets injured again and again and again. 
Now the football clubs, the soccer clubs that are paying 60 million euros for this type of footballer are not going to do that if they think he's at risk of having recurrent injuries and not playing. So there's research in sports medicine looking at this very thing, analogous to what happens in childbirth. So these women might be at high risk during pregnancy of having stress incontinence. But there are other factors like progesterone, which re relaxes the urethral sphincter, and the pressure of the fetus, which will cause stress incontinence. And of course, that should get better after delivery. But we know that in about 20% of women, it doesn't get better and it persists. And they are a very high risk group. So pregnancy itself may play a very important part, particularly in these people who potentially are at risk. But it's inconceivable that this labour and delivery does not play an important part as well. In the pathophysiology, we know, as you've already heard today, that you get damage to the levator muscle here. Sorry, let's go back. The levator. You get damage to the fascia, like I've just explained. Damage to the innervation, the pudendal nerve, to the levator. And here's an anal sphincter tear down here as well. So let's look at levator injuries. As if you were in the session here this morning, you'll have heard a lot about that already. We, we know this occurs in 20 to 40 percent of women after a first delivery from the work that's been done by uh, Delancey's group with MRI and Dietz with uh, uh, ultrasound. The fact is that these defects are relevant because they are associated with symptoms of incontinence and prolapse and sometimes faecal incontinence. And the factors associated with the injuries seem to be older age at the first delivery and difficult vaginal birth and instrumental delivery. Now there seems to be a return, in, certainly in our country, to the Keelan's forceps, and I think there's a, a talk on this later on today. That is of worry, because is this going to cause more damage again? It's easier to deliver a baby with Keelan's than it is with a Vontus, in some cases. Clearly the Vontus, you would think, has less risk of trauma because you're just putting a cup on the head, you're not actually putting metal into the vagina and rotating and so on. But I just wonder, is it actually the instrument that's that important or the reason it was required in the first place? Let's look at this clinical scenario. You've got a girl in her first pregnancy with a big baby, occipital posterior position. She's short stature, as I say, the babe's big. It's not surprising she's going to have a long labor, an epidural, syntocinin, and she's at high risk of having an instrumental delivery and an episiotomy. So when you look at the statistics and the studies, they'll say episiotomy and instrumental delivery are risk factors. But it may be that this is the risk factor, obstructed labor. And it's in these patients that we need to be thinking about how we can avoid damage. Now, just a bit of uh, lighthearted anthropology for you. Uh, this uh, is a, was a comment about uh, the fetal head pelvic relationship between different primates, the orangutan, chimp, gorilla, and human. And as somebody once said, there's a design fault here. From an evolutionary point of view, the human female pelvis has not increased at the same size as the fetal size has increased. So uh, as I say, somebody said there was a design fault and that the human female isn't the best design to give birth. And John Delancey's group have done this with some uh, modeling, engineering modeling, and you can see here how the, the muscle elevator in yellow is uh, quite relaxed at the beginning of labor. It then gets stretches further as the head descends. Here it is at the spine. But look what happens at crowning. Huge amount of stretch of the levator. And in fact, the engineers in uh, John Delancey's unit said, childbirth isn't possible. Well, of course it's possible, but you can see why you get damage to the levator muscle. So you might deliver a four and a half kilogram baby of a 160 centimeter woman, but spare a thought for what happens to her levator, her endopelvic fascia, her pudendal nerve, and the anal sphincter. So I want to look at one specific group, this short stature group with high birth weight. And this is some data from uh, Ian Milsom's group in Sweden where well, they've looked at the Swedish birth registry and they took women who'd only ever had one baby and looked at them 20 years later. That was 4,000 women in total. And they looked at the incidence of prolapse symptoms, prolapse and incontinence symptoms, and symptoms that had lasted for more than 10 years. And you can see here that almost double 
incidence of, in, of prolapse symptoms in women who are short stature with a big babe compared with women who are short stature with a lighter babe. Again, double the incidence in, of, of incontinence and prolapse, and threefold increase in symptoms that had lasted for more than 10 years. So this is a very high risk group, and there are now data to show that's the case. Now, should we consider doing caesarean for these women if we think they're at high risk of developing symptoms? Let's look at the evidence for this. We obviously have to back, uh, consider the risks of caesarean against the evidence. Well, let's look at incontinence first of all. The epidemiological data to date suggest that caesarean section is only partially protective against urinary incontinence after childbirth because the prevalence is still around 15 to 20 percent. But where caesarean does look or might well have a protective effect is here for prolapse. These are data from the prolonged study you heard about from Don Wilson. And you can see that in those women who had a stage, this is objectively measured prolapse, by the way, who had a stage two prolapse, it was only 6% in the caesarean section group, compared with nearly 25 to 30% with any form of vaginal birth. But that's objective prolapse, and one could argue it's not really that important. What is important are the symptoms. And the Swedish group again have looked at that, and you can see once more that those women, 20 years after delivery, if they'd had a caesarean, they were significantly less likely to have symptoms of prolapse, symptoms of prolapse and incontinence, and uh, symptoms lasting more than 10 years. Now, interestingly, there was no difference between the caesarean, whether the caesarean was done in labor or electively, which might suggest that the trauma and the damage is actually occurring at the time of delivery, late in labor. So maybe that is something we can avoid. The question may then come up, okay, these women have some symptoms for a year or two, they're relatively mild, but at 20 years, how many of them have actually needed an operation for incontinence or prolapse? These are more data from Sweden, where they looked at the database on a huge number of patients, 33,000 who'd been delivered by cesarean against age-matched vaginal deliveries of 63,000. The numbers at 26 years who'd had, or the percentages who'd had surgery at 26 years was five times greater in the normal delivery group. Now, 3.4% isn't particularly high, but don't forget that's 3.5% or 4% of 63,000 women. So you're talking about a lot of patients and a lot of surgery. So how can we counsel people and our colleagues? I think we have to discuss, and we're duty bound to discuss and present the evidence to our patients as well as to our colleagues about the potential risks both of vaginal birth and caesarean section. We wouldn't dream of not presenting risks when we're doing surgery, so why don't we present risks to patients when we're talking about childbirth? If a woman says, I plan more than two children, then I think the risks of caesarean, particularly placenta accreta, are significant, and there's evidence for that. Less than two, then maybe they could consider caesarean if they have been shown to be at risk. But don't forget, people decide to get divorced and have second marriages and second families, so there is an issue there. There's also the argument that with children born to mothers by caesarean section uh, are at higher risk of asthma and diabetes. There is absolutely no evidence for that. There is a statistical association, but as the authors say, there is no evidence of cause and effect. We've also got to consider cost implications, but you can offset that against the cost of prolapse and incontinence surgery in the future. And I would argue that if uh, you consider a woman who's had a 16-hour labor, uh, lots of syntocin and epidural, has to go to the operating room for uh, instrumental delivery, and compare that with the costs of a cesarean section done at 9 a.m. in the morning, I bet you the costs aren't a great deal different. So I hope I've gone through in this short presentation a little bit about risks to the pelvic floor. We must raise awareness. We've got to identify women at risk, and I hope our UR Choice acronym and study will maybe do that in terms of primary prevention. I think now there is something we can do about the short maternal height and high large birth weight uh, cases because I think we can say to our obstetric colleagues, maybe it's better to do an earlier caesarean if progress isn't being made in labor to try and protect the pelvic floor in those cases but we have to balance that up about repeated caesarean section. So if we get it right, I do believe in the long term, we can have fit, healthy young women who can jump on trampolines and not become incontinent.
Thank you very much.